Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Other than just how much you missed me other than that <laughs> other than i've been crying for two weeks straight mm -hmm. how do you think we did on uh, the guilty pleasure now that you're back now that they they hit i think uh i think you got the, the blot score didn't do well for you on week two <laughs> i don't think so i don't think so in fact i think it, it came as an a, a straight up offense <laughs> <laughs> That I made him watch knowing, oh, poor yeah. Ben. 
Sorry about that one, Ben. <laughs> that was that was good stuff. Well, like I said, it is a guilty pleasure for me. I acknowledge that <laughs> that uh, most people don't like knowing. Yes, but but damn it, I still do. So take that. And you know, we got some tweets out of that one. Yes, we actually had uh, a nice little. Uh, uh, kind of a tweet battle going on with two of the writers. So that was kind of fun. That was redemption, actually, that they don't know what the Black Stones mean either. <laughs> I know. That I made that was... me so happy. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, just to, just to, just the, the blot report. I know I'm going overboard, but I was actually upset by knowing. It did nothing right for me. While Buckaroo Banzai at least had a sense of humor and recognized that it was not a great film. Okay, that's kind of a sucker punch. Uh, knowing takes itself entirely too seriously and never delivers on the profound message it seems to have hinged upon. Sorry, you're a great guy. You like great <laughs> films, but this one doesn't fit that category. And then the lowest blow of them all, only because I, I also have that deep regret. I can't. He says, "Can't believe Pete conceded the bank job." <laughs> and then you, of course, sticking the shiv right in. <laughs> Knowing you, I'm sure you dwell on this every day and let it spoil your vacation. Oh, did yeah. you? You did, yes, didn't you? I did. I thought the whole two weeks. Fuming every night, every... staring up at the ceiling. That's right. <laughs> Picturing my face up there and flicking knives at it, right? I'd get, to get ready for bed every night and I would just rip my clothes off in anger. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Yeah, like turned into the whole. I, I did. I have. I have a very limited wardrobe now. My vacation <laughs> wardrobe was very limited. Uh, um, that was so much fun. Uh, that was really fun. Yes. Um, do we have a good times have, with guilt? <laughs> too, too true. Uh, it's been. We've have, have we missed any big news we need to talk about? Anything big happened in the world of movies this last two weeks? That we missed? Well, we did lose. Eli Wallach, yeah, who did pass away while we were on our vacations. Mm. That was sad. That is sad. Especially as somebody who stayed working, really, practically right up to the, uh, the very end. Of his... end. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. And especially since we're going to be talking about the, uh, the Man With No Name trilogy soon. So. I know. So that was sad news. Other than that, what other big news has happened? I don't know. Um, oh, I feel like there was some Star Wars news. There's been oh, I the the, the uh, IMAX. Well, I just I I it's not really Star Wars news. Yes, IMAX, but more that I love. I really love how J.J. Abrams is uh, is is hitting social. If this is him, you know, I know he's a busy guy, but that from his bad robot Instagram account, they tweets the. Uh, hashtag best format ever uh, with it's just a picture of the IMAX camera shooting the deserts of uh, mm. Tunisia. And uh, I was, my heart was warmed by that. That's a film that it's, it's funny because I have a friend who keeps sending me information about it and I have a, had a hard time getting excited about it. And he's very frustrated with me I because be fr- I, I, not, I think I'm getting I'm, frustrated with I'm not sharing in any childish glee about the new Star Wars film, and I'm reserving it for when it opens in the hopes that it actually brings out my childish glee. I don't want to be hurt by this movie. Andy, you are a guy I think, who wears... I think that's what it boils down You to. wear your childish glee right on your sleeve, a feather in your I proverbial do. cap. How is it that your childish glee is in the closet right now, is hiding in the closet in the dark? It's not hiding. I've locked it. <laughs> I've locked it away for this film because I don't want to be disappointed because George disappointed me with episodes one, two, and three. I think this is different. I think this is going to be different. It's a whole new area. That's what the thing you have to wrap your head around. This is a whole new thing. They're I know, going full Marvel on Star Wars now. I, I know, and that also makes me a little nervous. And And so I'm trying to avoid looking at pictures from the set. I'm trying to avoid stories. I just want to not know anything about it. When it comes out, I want to be filled with childish glee. I'm going to let it out of the box when I go sit in the theater and hope that my childish glee is satisfied. 
I'm going to call childishly protective services. <laughs> They'll never find I feel, it. I feel a little bit like you're abusing your childish glee <laughs> and that there need, we need some sort of an intervention. It's okay to be happy, Andy. It's okay. I don't know what you're talking about. Leave me alone. <laughs> I uh I, go I do, do another budget. I have to I have to go to another budget. I have to tell you I I was a little bit I you know and I don't like to to be amused over others' pain but it 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 made me smile ironically especially now that he's okay. I didn't smile initially because it's sad when accidents happen to good people. But just hearing that uh, Han Solo broke his leg on the door of the Millennium Falcon closed on it. <laughs> I got to, I, you know, once the dust settled, I was able to smile about that. I felt like there was something <laughs> ironic in there. I can't quite put my finger on it. That's but, funny. But it was amusing. So much so that they had to delay shooting. I know, but they're back on schedule. Yeah. But you wouldn't know that because of Childish Glee. I don't know that. Mm -hmm. yeah. All, right. All I know is they're behind on their budget. <laughs> Let's tell the people where we're from. Where are we from? <laughs> Real everybody, I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hi ho! And we spoil movies once again. Thank you so much for putting your movie spoilage needs in our uh, caring hands. Uh, you can find out more about the show at thenextreel.com. You can subscribe to the show for free in iTunes or or uh, Stitcher Smart Radio or, you know, anywhere uh, finer podcasts are served. Uh, uh, you can read the blog stylings of one Steve Sarmento. Uh, you can catch up with all of our monthly new release shows at the uh, on the film board. We've got one coming up, uh, which I know we already said we weren't going to talk about, but I've already started, so I'm going to finish <laughs> so, this one out. We're going to be doing Dawn of the Planet of the Apes uh, this weekend, Saturday. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that's the thing. Looking forward to it. Looking very, very, very much forward to that. I've been catching up on all my behind-the-scenes stuff of uh, uh, from Rise of Planet of the Apes, and... <laughs> Oh, God, I just can't get enough of that Andy Circus. He's good. What a gentleman scholar. Have you watched any of the, the behind the scenes in that uh, on that movie? On it's Rise? Really in, on Rise. It's interesting watching. They have some scenes where you can watch where it's uh, yeah. just all the motion. They're in their motion capture. Yeah, with the, they have the little arm sticking out in front of his face with the LED lights and the green dots on his face. Mm -hmm. yeah. Crazy. That's yeah, pretty with, amazing. And they give him the teeth. To give him yep. the yeah. teeth. He, he's like a little vampire man. <laughs> that you know, that was maybe the, the news. It was that he signed on to Star Wars. Yeah, but you wouldn't know that because of childish belief. I have no idea what you're talking about. Hmm. I don't even know if we need to go. Uh, uh, I, we're not gonna. Like, do we need to to do a recap of what we missed because we we had pre-recorded the guilty pleasure show, so we didn't do a uh, a full report of those who won. The Instagram Pony Prize Guest the Movie Challenge over the last two weeks. But we do have two new two winners. Oh, yes. Yeah. So do you want to do that and then talk about this week? Should we just sure. throw it out there? Sure. Where do we stand? Yeah. Uh, we had uh, two weeks ago, Bad Boys and Cameron L. Ryan won that one. And then last week, uh, Jenny Level, I think. Jenny uh, Level. I went to high school with Jenny Level. Well, there you go. Congratulations, the, Jenny. She's, she's won before. And the only time she and I uh, interact at all is when she wins... The Pony Prize. She's won, I think, twice now. Well, congratulations, Jenny. She won for Silverado. And then this week, uh, Joe Miha won for The Prestige. I got I to gotta plug Joe Miha. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, a, he's an illustrator, artist. Oh, yeah. If you aren't following Joe Miha on Twitter, uh, you should absolutely follow him because he's been doing these smoking cool uh, uh, samurai masks of uh, Avengers. Oh, cool! Heads, they're fantastic. Wow, they're really cool. It was probably a couple of weeks ago that these these floated out there, but they're in his images on Twitter, uh, and totally worth checking out if you're into uh, fantastic art. Um, you you should check us Joe Me Ha J O M I H A on the Twitter. He's very he's, cool. He's talented people that Joe Miha. Very nice. As Joel Michael Harris. Let's uh, uh, mm -hmm. get it out there. Anyway, 
Uh, so there you go. That's awesome. Congratulations. Yes. Do we have any other? Any, was that it? That was it. That was all three. All right. There's the update. Let's talk trailers. <laughs> go first because wow why has it taken people so long to make this movie do you know what i'm talking about i know what you're talking about all is by my side jimmy hendrix directed by uh, written and directed by john ridley starring imogene poots Haley atwell uh burn gorman and as jimmy hendrix andre benjamin Oh, yeah. He looks Doesn't... so good. I know. He looks amazing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. I, uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I love I love some Hendrix. I really do. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Entertainment Weekly just had an article, like, a couple weeks ago, maybe, about um, movies about singers and, you know, why it's sometimes hard to get them made. And they actually briefly mentioned this one. And then I guess that there has just been a thing with uh, with Hendrix's family where they would not release any of his songs or wow. something like that for a movie. And so that, I think, was one of the big struggles with getting a movie about Hendrix made. And so what John Ridley decided to do, at least my understanding, is he did this based on his life leading up to becoming famous so you don't really even get any of the classic songs mm. i think it's going to be a song. great it's going to be a great story anyway oh yeah uh, this is it, it he is one of those characters that whose story just needs to be told uh, he came well he came to rise at a time when there was so much you know just uh, hatred in the world and there's just you know such a conflict in, for so many reasons in different parts of the world, whether it's, you know, racial tensions or, right. or social class or whatever, and people from different places. And it, I think that he stood for a lot and he threatened a lot of people um, because of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, and, and, you know, I mean, just, uh, uh, so there he is at this sort of uh, intersection of great cultural conflict and, musical conflict i mean he introduces new styles new approaches to the instrument that um really shocked a lot of people so i i think it's going to be a fantastic uh, fantastic film i you know i'm not quite sure what to make of john um of uh, of john ridley he's he you know we're big fans of uh 12 years a slave um which uh, you know he wrote. He wrote Red Tails, which I I never saw, but my daughter actually saw it and loved it. Um, and, and he wrote Three Kings, which I love. I know, and wrote Three Kings. So he's on this string of like really strong uh, films. But his his history b- before that was you know a lot of TV, a lot of comedy. Um, so hopefully he's he, you know I don't know he's, he seems like a. Um, do you ever see U Turn? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sean Penn. I didn't. I don't think I saw that. Sean Penn, Jennifer Lopez. Yeah, uh, Oliver Stone movie that he that John Ridley wrote. Yeah, he wrote. It's an interesting movie. It's it's fun. I mean, it's uh, you know I think Oliver Stone actually chose to call it an Oliver Stone movie, not yeah. an Oliver Stone film, uh-huh. using the uh, differentiation in the name there, which yeah. I thought was interesting. It's uh, it's fun. Uh, John Ridley is one of those writers who really seems to. I, I don't know if it's because he gets really passionate about his projects. But he gets uh, ends up seeming to have a lot of fights with directors that he works with, um, and he has only he, directed. Um, he's as far as I know. I think the only film he's directed, according to IMDb, is is uh, uh, Cold Around the Heart. Yeah, which from nineteen ninety seven. Yeah, it was that hit David Caruso vehicle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the one. <laughs> Good times. Yeah, uh, so. I'm curious to see how he does with uh, with Jimmy, considering he's writing and directing. So if he has to right. get in a fight with anyone, it's only his self. Yes. Yeah. His own self. His own self. Yeah. Well, I can't wait. Very much looking forward to this. Again, Andre Benjamin looks fantastic. And, um, yeah, it's worth checking out. What uh, This comes out, uh, oh, my gosh, I clicked away from the tab. August was, 8th in the U.K. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think it's uh, also August here in the U. United States. Excellent. All right. August. Your, yeah. Your turn. I uh, 
I'm doing a movie that's definitely looks a little darker than uh, All Is By My Side. It yeah, looks... <laughs> I would say that's a fair assessment. <laughs> it looks, uh, you know, downright uh, frightening. It's a film called Cold Water that started playing in festivals last year and has been on the, the festival circuit um, into 2014 now has a, uh, a limited August release date here in the U.S. It's called Cold Water, and it is a film about a uh, a kid who you know clearly must have had some sort of trouble as a juvenile, as a young kid, and his mother sends him to one of these uh, uh, reform facilities where they are going to reform you one way or another, and they're going to readjust you and fix you. And, you know, it looks downright frightening. Uh, first off, it kind of just looks like the opening for um, Full Metal Jacket. It has that boot camp sort of feel. Um, but then it just becomes brutal when these people are just, you know, the, the guards or whatever you want to call them, the, the adjusters are just beating these, these kids and just, you know, clearly uh, overstepping their bounds. And they really have to kind of, you know, escape really one of them finally has to um, escape and run 25 miles to get to the nearest town to try to get help and uh it, it's kind of this like freaky uh you know dramatic thriller and it looks pretty good and the reason i picked it is because a buddy of mine is actually the director of photography on it and um i saw him post about it on facebook and i got pretty excited so i wanted to make sure i plugged it for him and let people know that it's out there well who's your who's your buddy jason Carruthers. Jason Carruthers. That's right. So, uh, so good old Jason. He shot this. He works a lot on uh, what's that um, fireman show with? Oh, uh, d- d- burn, burn, burn notice. Burn notice. I don't... No, that's that not, what it is. No, that's, that's not, not it. it. It's the one with the comedian who's not a comedian yeah, anymore. Right. Right. Uh, Dennis Leary. Dennis Leary. Right. And his show. What is his show, Andy? <laughs> I don't know. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know why I brought it up. He works, uh, well, he works on he works on uh, that and uh, uh, no, sorry, Chicago Fire. That's the one. No, he works that's on. not Dennis one of those, Leary. No, it's one of the fire shows. <laughs> I couldn't remember which oh one it was. Gosh. I know. I'm really selling you well, Jason. But uh, no, so he worked on this, and uh, you know, it looks like a, a an interesting film, and it looks just one of those horrifying things that. You know, you hear these stories in the news about kids who go to these things and, you know, how they get abused and these camps get closed and all that sort of stuff. And Yeah, not a good, that's not a good uh, kind of camp. No, not fun. It's not quite the same as a Hunger Games camp. No, you prefer camp. the Hunger Games camps. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to have to go down that road. Yes, yeah. exactly. Always, always get the arrow, get the bow. <laughs> yeah, these, these poor kids don't have any they arrows. Have no, no bows. Nope, nope. Nope. But yeah, uh, that's that's uh, my film. It opens in August, and you know another reason why I picked it, Pete, what? is because it's all about authority, and it has that lovely little Oscar Wilde quote in the middle of the trailer about how, um, you know, people anytime somebody will exercise authority, somebody will fight authority. Whenever there's a man who exercises authority, yeah. there's a man who resists authority. That great Oscar Wilde quote, which I think fits in nicely with our upcoming series. You're talking that about that we're doing right now. That we're starting right now. Okay, okay. I just I needed <laughs> I needed a little bit more. It's been a while, man. I know. I've got the pneumonia. Come on. <laughs> um, yes, I agree with that. And we are starting this. And I, you know, usually, you know, we work toward a, you know, fancy segue. Usually it's not a very successful one, but it leads into the trailer. <laughs> And yes. then I take the trailer, and so I usually I cut it down a little bit. I, I yes. re-edit the trailer. I am not going to do that tonight. Well, wait a minute. I'm not going to do the campy little intro and then cut the trailer. It's a long trailer, and so I'm I'm saying that ahead of time. Why am I doing this? Have you because... heard the trailer for this movie? Oh yes, I have. <laughs> it is possibly the single best trailer of all time. Right up there with Strange Days. It's the sort of trailer that you could only expect from somebody who is a member of Monty Python. It makes me <laughs> so exceedingly happy. And so I want to kick off our conversation uh, with the full, unabridged version of the original 
the, I, I don't even know if this was a theatrical trailer. It was the official trailer. Um, for, I'm sure it was the theatrical. I'm sure. I, it's got to have been the theatrical trailer uh, for 1991 time. Nin- 1981. Bandits. That's what I said. 1981 in my head. Time bandits. Remember my voice? I do trailers. All kinds of trailers. 73, take two. One day they'll put me in a film, a proper full-length job. Until then, I'm just stuck with this sort of stuff. Go and see this. Don't miss that. The most terrifying thing you ever saw is coming to babysit for you tonight. All right, cut it there. Look, just read what's on the script, will you? What? The script. Other way up. Ah. Ready? Yes, yes. You flock to see brief encounters for the special event. Close. Huh? Close encounters. Close encounters. The film. Oh, I never saw it. Well, forget that film. We're on about our film. Time Bandits. The word. Time Bandits. The one you are supposed to be promoting. Remember? <laughs> you flock to see close encounters for the special effects. You went to Superman to see a man fly. You went to Star Wars for the droids. You went... Now what? What's page two? It's under page one. See? Oh, man. You went to Star Wars. Time bandits can offer you much, much more. It's not the special effects or flying men or droids which makes time bandits a unique cinematic... Cinematic! You know, pertaining to the cinema. Cinematic experience, it's the makeup. Yes, folks, you've never seen anything like it. Men made up to look like monsters. Monsters made up to look like men. Look alike men made up to look different. Different men made up to look alike. No expense has been paired, spared on the pan stick, the pan stick. No expense has been spared flying in the world's greatest makeup man. Just a minute, just a minute. What about the plot? The what? The plot. What the film is about. Well, I haven't seen it, have I? Haven't seen it? You're sitting there telling millions of people to go and see a film you haven't even seen? Well, I can't see every film I do, now, can I? Oh, wonderful. Terrific. Look, give me that. What are you doing? Taking over. You're out. O-U-T. Finished. Kaput. Finito. And what about the trailer? I'll do it. Time Bandits is an awfully good film. We have worked ever so hard on it. It's a tremendous adventure story. We like it, and we're pretty sure you will. (laughs) What's wrong with it? It's direct, punchy, honest. Honest. (laughs) Honest. Honest. What's that got to do with it? Jolly good. <laughs> Jolly good. Jolly good. So you were robbing, you were robbing long. <laughs> Four foot eleven. Four foot eleven. <laughs> that is a, my, that is a long time. Then. <laughs> oh. oh, goodness. Possibly one of the funniest roles John Cleese has ever done. It is so short and so, so sweet. Yes, yes. Oh, my goodness. It's just perfect. <laughs> Time band. It's 19, uh, 2001. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's, uh, this was a, the, what, how did the, how did this film stack up for you? This is the first in the, uh, what does he call this? The Imagination Trilogy? Yeah, it's a trilogy that's not a real trilogy. Right. Um, but it is a trilogy that he kind of, he called, yeah, his trilogy of imagination. He realized when he was making Baron Munchausen that he oddly had made these three films that kind of focused on, on the, as he says, the craziness of our awkwardly ordered society and the desire to escape it through whatever means possible. And the three films in it, Time Bandits, Brazil, and Ad- Adventures of Baron Munchausen, look at it through the eyes of first a child, then a man in his 30s, and then finally an old man. Yes. Yes. And the child in this film is 11-year-old Kevin. Mm -hmm. Kevin. Uh, The whole concept... And, you know, it's funny. When I saw this movie as a a child, I mean, when this movie came out, I was... 
what what are we in nineteen eighty one nine? Mm-hmm. Uh, and eight nine. eight nine somewhere in there. I it, it like I don't. I'm not entirely sure. I, I I I'm sure I didn't understand all of it. Uh, when I f- first saw it, I mean, I, I'm sure that came later. I'm not. I, I'm actually not sure I understand all of it now. <laughs> but I do remember absolutely loving it. Uh, yeah. I felt like everything, like you know, for for years and years, uh, my dad would ask me, "Hey, hey, Pete, what's the perfect movie?" And I would say, "Time Bandits," because it was to me absolutely perfect. The vignette approach to uh, to storytelling. Each of the little vignettes were just the right length for my attention span. And then it would move on to practically a new movie with all these familiar uh, characters introducing me to some uh, new thing or deflating some of uh, our heroes, our great heroes like, you know, Robin Hood. Um, it, it was just perfect. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think it, it showed me at that age just what uh, the sort of the power of storytelling so far beyond, uh, you know, what else we had grown up with, you know, in the 70s. Um it, it it here's what it did. It treated young people um, s- with sophistication. It yeah, it gave young people a chance to watch something that didn't necessarily need to be kind of cleaned up. Right, right. It it felt uh, you know it felt uh, dirty. It, it felt uh, real. It felt bloody. It felt like things could actually happen. Um, I mean, his parents get blown up for Pete's sake. Right, I mean, right. it's, 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 this is that world where it, it doesn't feel like uh, adults had to come through and sanitize it because they felt like a child couldn't take it. The other thing I think that it does really quite well is is um, this idea that, you know, it doesn't delve into, even though it's time bandits, right? And the whole conceit of the film is that there are these you know, these little people who worked for God and decided that working for God was boring and that robbing banks and stealing things from people was vastly more entertaining. So they steal this map and they go off and and do their thing. They never get stuck or mired in the conceit of time travel. Uh, And so they, there are no big metaphysical questions about how they are possibly doing what they're doing. Uh, and how, if there is a time hole in Kevin's closet or right in the middle of Napoleon's, uh, you know, the city and, uh, that Napoleon is sacked, why nobody has fallen through this time hole in the past, for example? Like, they never really get into any of these questions, and that, that is really okay. Uh, right. And uh, until the very end, where they do ask the big metaphysical questions, you know, why, why uh, you know, when Kevin a- approaches... Uh, the supreme being, uh, and and actually starts posing some of these some of the bigger questions, and they have just a wonderful little toss off bit that we'll we'll talk about, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but generally, I I love the the way that the film does not uh, does not uh, get too tied up in its own uh, logic. It just moves you forward on an adventure. Yeah, yeah, the whole time. I mean, everything about it is set up in a way where it makes sense. It talks. Uh, it it creates this world that we're completely invested in the 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 realities of of the way things happen in here to the point where yes, this is a world with uh, God and the devil or the supreme being and evil as they are called in this film. Uh, yet there also is this uh, land of myth, you know that that you can also go to that you typically don't put in the same realm as a world that has 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 God and the devil in it. And so it's, it, it, but none of it, like you said, none of it is anything that is ever questioned. It all just, it all just happens. It all makes sense. And even at the end, when uh, Sean Connery reappears as a fireman, um, it, it just kind of seems like a, a like a, a little nod that fits. It, it all uh, fits within this world that he created. And it's a world that much like um, the film uh, the story that or this adventure that Kevin goes on, where 
if you look carefully around his room and you see all these little toys, you can see that there's knights and there's, um, you know, he's got a, a picture uh, or he's reading this book about uh, King Agamemnon and he's, he's got, uh, you know, all these little toys. He's got this like Lego castle and chessboard and stuff. All this stuff really kind of fits into all the adventures he's goes on. He goes on with, uh, with these, uh, these dwarves as if they were all, uh, it, it kind of figments of his imagination, and he's just dreaming all of this. But it's also much the way that uh, Terry Gilliam kind of builds this film, where it's something that we just kind of go along with, and it's this adventure that we go on because we we are also just buying into all these little um, things that he creates, as if you know this is this world that he's created. It's it's a a film made by a filmmaker who knows how to create worlds. I mean, we've talked about world building quite a bit in the past, but this is a filmmaker who really creates unique worlds that don't necessarily need to be explained. It's like once the elements are in place, he can just let them be, and you just feel that there's kind of this reason and this history for it, and it all is logical. I agree. The film was written by, um, uh, obviously, by uh, uh, Gilliam, Terry Gilliam and Michael Palin, yeah. And um, did you catch the uh, the interview, the two of them talking about their, it's about a half hour interview. I guess it was on the, on maybe it was on the re-release of Blu-ray. I found it elsewhere. It was about a half hour of them just talking about the act of writing the film. Sadly, it's not on the Blu-ray and I missed it. It is, uh, I almost wish I didn't uh, see it uh, for a couple of reasons. First, it's... It, a, it's hysterical. I mean, it's just it's wonderful just watching these old men talk about how they came about writing this thing. And Palin, you know, he says, you know, I, I don't really remember much about it. All I know is you came to me with this working title, Time Bandits, and said you had a great script. And I opened the pages, and it, there were just a lot of blank pages. And, <laughs> uh, and, and so, you know, they worked hard together. He said, you know, part of the reason that they work so well together, and this is exactly the way he says that he characterizes um, how they wrote uh, Python, which is that Michael Palin would sit down and write this great script, and then he would invariably get stuck. And so he would call Gilliam, and he would say, I need you to do an animation or something to get me from A to B, because I'm stuck, and I don't know how to get out of it. And so that's how they'd end up with all of these fancy, well-placed kind of animations, you know, mm-hmm. that, that he would do in Python. And in this one, he said, it was the same thing. I would realize I would write this little vignette, and it would get to this point where I don't know how to end it. And so Gilliam would say, hey, why don't we just put a time hole right in the middle of things and have them run through it? And then they would fall <laughs> out of the sky and into a barn. And uh, that's how they would just make the transition. It would just be this abrupt kind of... We're moving on now, and this is how it's going to be in this film, which I thought was fantastic. The other one specifically that they, they came to, which surprised me about um, about Agamemnon, about Sean Connery, uh, everything in the film, right, all of the little vignettes, right, are all uh, represented in Kevin's room, mm-hmm. as we've said, right? All the little pieces, as you said, they're all in Kevin's room, and they are all also represented in the big fight scene at the end, right? except for Sean Connery. Right. Uh, because they ran out of time with him shooting the Agamemnon stuff, and right. he had to move on. So he wasn't available to shoot that. And it was actually Sean Connery that came back at the end and said, hey, you know what? I've got a little time later. What if I come back uh, as, you know, as this fireman saving the day, um, you know, at the uh, in, in the end? Because I can't be there. Like at the end, Fidget, I, I guess, is it Fidget who runs in with all of the, the yeah. Greek archers? Agamemnon was supposed to lead that charge. And in the, the script originally, he was supposed to lead the charge and he was going to die in that sequence. Um but they had an interesting take on it, which I, I'm interested in your uh, uh, in your thoughts here. Of all of the the vignettes, right? They they take on Napoleon Bonaparte and they make him um, just sort of a laughable uh, man obsessed with the uh, height of famous uh, tyrants. Mm-hmm. They uh, t- they hit the Titanic and they. <laughs> They don't notice that it's the Titanic. Uh, they they take on uh, Robin Hood, who is uh, who ends up taking all their loot and giving it to poor to the poor, which is fantastic. It sort of deflate his uh, relationship there. Uh, but with Agamemnon, it, that's the first character that they don't actively deflate. He is uh, a hero. He's not uh, not somebody to lampoon, um, and. They felt in the end, even though they arrived accidentally 
uh, at this solution of having Sean Connery or having Agamemnon come back as a fireman. Uh, uh, Gilliam says, you know, that that is absolutely the way it should end because he's he's not a character. Everybody else, we make a joke and they they end up dying at the end. But but uh, the Agamemnon character is he is the 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 perfect father. Uh, he's the one who should live to save the day. Yeah. No, and, and I think that's very nice. And I think having him show up as the fireman, uh, I was talking about this with my daughter who who watched it with me. And uh, you, and she loved it. And she, um, we were talking about why he appeared at the end there, and uh, and I told her that it was the same actor, and that he came back for that, and and explained to her that sometimes an actor plays many parts, but in this particular case, it was like King Agamemnon, who obviously wasn't jumping through time to be with him, but it was like his spirit was there to now guide him. And it's it's as if even though his real parents have ju- has ju- have basically just been blown up by touching a piece of pure evil, they uh, Kevin is going to be okay because uh, whatever he does in his life, the spirit of King Agamemnon, who really is a very uh, very much his spiritual father, is going to take care of and make sure he does okay. Yeah. Oh, I like the way you put it too. <laughs> It's it's nice. It's it's a really nice uh, way to kind of play that character, and I'm glad that they bring him back. I mean, it is a pr- pretty brutal ending, you know, to see you know as his parents just get blown up after touching the uh, the burnt roast in the oven, which happens to look just like the a piece of pure, pure evil. Pure evil. <laughs> which I always that's just one of my favorite lines in the movie. Mom, Dad, don't touch it. It's, it's pure evil. 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 <laughs> But and then uh, and then they're but they're parents who are very ineffective. I mean, we've seen that from the beginning. These are parents that are more in line with evil, really, who is more inclined to build because he just wants to build and to to make things that, you know, like he says, if it were up to me, I would have been making lasers eight o'clock day one. He's not interested in all this this nonsense that he sees uh the supreme being having been making he would rather get the real things out computers and and uh, uh laser beams and all this sort of stuff and uh, just kind of build and and he seems very much the voice of consumerism and we see that with the parents who are obsessed with watching this tv show your money or your life and uh, I mean, their furniture is all like it's almost as if it's been hermetically sealed. Right. They they are constantly comparing themselves to their neighbors in the sense of what do they have? Oh, well, theirs does it in eight minutes, and you know they're jealous because theirs does it so fast, and all this sort of stuff. Um, and they seem very disinterested in Kevin to the point where the only conversations they really have with him revolve around uh, discipline and dinner and bedtime really yes. <laughs> it's yeah. like that's all they talk to him about and so it's no surprise when they show up uh or at least their images show up at the end when uh they are in the palace of uh evil and they see the game show host along with his parents as kind of the you know the the vanna whites behind him and uh it you know it just it it struck me uh as very fitting this time that they were there and Sean Connery is the fire is the fireman, you right. know, at the end, saving saving him. Basically, a representative of good and somebody who saves people. Right, that perfect father figure, mm-hmm. his hero. Yeah, the only hero that the other guy that the other you know that the 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 gang uh, was not able to you know kind of bring down. Right. Right. Um, yes, I uh, totally agree. Um, the so this is. First, a, a film about sort of the representation of technology and materialism, and uh, and at once a film about uh, you know religion, uh, organized religion, whatever. Uh, and it is manifested between the supreme being and, uh, of course, um, you know, uh, evil. Um, and he is not in this movie enough. I, I, he's probably in the movie just perfect. Uh, he's probably right, right. just perfect. But I, like, he's got the best lines. Uh, he he is, it is the perfect uh, fascination, the perfect sort of frivolousness that you want out of a being that is pure evil, right? He just, oh, yeah. just 
wields his evil uh, with great abandon. You know, anybody says anything to him, he just lifts his finger and blows them up. You know, and just and then continues about his about his day. Um, the uh, what do you think about the uh, the dynamic between supreme being and evil? I I mean I love it. I think uh, David Warner is the perfect embodiment of evil in this film, um, in not a Tim Curry legend sort of way, right? Um, which really probably would be the embodiment of evil. <laughs> that really is just like the creepy devil evil. Yeah, yeah. This is is just like the funny evil, but he still is evil. And I, it's one of those things where, again, I, I love it. And the, Terry Gilliam is not afraid to blow people up or blow dogs up. And, and evil just does all these evil things. And I, I think it's, it's, it's great. I, I, I don't know if I can think of an example, but I think of evil in uh, lesser films that would have had kind of this God and evil sort of thing where evil would not be just destroying people and blowing them up, but evil would instead be, uh, you know, making them do stupid things, you know, yes. thing, and, and that to me seems like what happens in a lot of children films um, where they don't trust the audience enough. They don't trust the kids to understand it. And so instead of evil actually just blowing someone up, evil would just, you know, make someone do some uh, buffoonery. Yeah, I know. That's a good point. And uh, and Terry Gilliam doesn't slip into that. He he understands that kids are going to get it and they're going to kind of appreciate that. And the fact that this evil does that and the supreme being, I think, is also kind of frightening uh, in and of himself. I mean, he very much. Uh, I, I think Terry Gilliam has acknowledged that his appearance initially very much feels very Wizard of Oz-ish, kind of this floating head. And um, But as a kid, I was equally afraid of the Supreme Being as I was of evil because he was, uh, you know, he just is so ominous. And as he says when he finally appears as Sir Ralph Richardson, oh, it's it's like, it's such a show. I hate I hate putting it on, but I suppose... I suppose I must. It's what people have come to expect, you know, or whatever it is. It's like that's what people expect of him. They don't just expect this old man to kind of just wander in and out. They expect this big showy thing. Well, and and that there is, um, there is this sort of emotional um, uh, battle of wills between the supreme being and evil. Uh, the way they the the way they play it as sort of just this. This bit of pettiness, right? God isn't interested in technology. He knows nothing of the potential of the microchip or the silicon revolution. Look how he spends his time. 43 species of parrots. Nipples for men. Slugs. Slugs! He created slugs. They can't hear. They can't speak. They can't operate machinery. I mean, are we not in the hands of a lunatic? Which is... Which, which is... a. It's a brilliant little manifestation of, I think, one of Terry Gilliam's um, kind of inner statements of this film, which is that the the battle between good and evil in sort of the context of religion is is one that that uh, can look sort of ridiculous. Uh, yeah. And and you know, at the very end, we talked about these the big questions that are asked. As Kevin asks, you know, why does there have to be evil? And the Supreme Being rolls his eyes as he says, I think it has something to do with free will. Right. <laughs> right. He's so dismissive. But, right. uh, but I mean, really, it's, it's like it's kind of an answer. But at the same time, it's, it's not really giving you any answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I, I think that's one of those really uh, kind of interesting messages of, the, of this film. It's the one that, that I think is so fascinating that it's a, it's a message in a film that is um you know otherwise geared for kids yeah powerful i think it's powerful well it, yeah it, it lets us be in a place where you know this whole free will thing we can pick what we, you know do we want to be on the side of good or on the side of evil you know and right. it's it it gives you all it lets you realize that there are these choices it there's not just this this one way of looking at things. It's, uh, it, I, I find it very interesting. And looking at this film, you know, over decades now of my life, I, it just, there's always more 
interesting little things like this to to look at and pull out of it. You know, it's a, a completely different experience from watching it as a kid where I saw it as just an adventure film. Now it's just like, gosh, aside from the fun adventure that Kevin gets to go on, there's all this other interesting uh, meat in there that you can look at and uh, and just really think about and enjoy. Well, to that point, I mean, back not to kind of perseverate on good versus evil, but when you think about uh, you know, the motivation behind evil, you know, all he wants to do, all he's focused on is uh, increasing technology in the world, mm-hmm. right? He wants more technology. And it's interesting to watch this film today, uh, kind of living at a time where we're seeing this massive growth of technology, right? And, uh, of course, there are some, there are some big... Uh, discussions, right? A good versus evil. How much screen time should you get on, w- for kids? That kind of a thing. But then we get the this view of the supreme being when he's, you know, his relationship with just about everything, everyone else in the film is, I'm going to chase you down and I'm going to punish you. I'm going to send you to the undergrowth department with brackens and shrubs and I'm going to cut your salary. And Randall says, oh, thank you, sir. And the supreme being, well, I am the nice one. <laughs> Thank you for cutting me down, for giving me less, for punishing me, for making my life harder. And, um, you know, that's that's great. While all the while evil just wants to make more technology. I find that a fascinating uh, counterpoint uh, in this film. It really is. The, uh, the, well, and you can see it from... From Gilliam's perspective, as somebody who went on to make Brazil, you can really see this whole thing with technology, uh, the evils of technology really coming out in in his way of thinking from what evil is saying here about technology, or evil being the one kind of pushing technology, leading into what has technology done to society when you look at it through the eyes of Brazil, right? Right. So, So that's... That is a very interesting way of, of or I guess you, I should say it's a very obvious way of defining why Terry Gilliam kind of has evil, the one behind all the technology, in Time Bandits. Because clearly that's kind of his way of thinking. But looking at where we are today and seeing, um, thinking about the technology that we use, it, is, it does strike me as very interesting that evil is the one who... Uh, is kind of pushing the technology. Well, I think that's the that's that's really my point that yeah. that you know for those of us who live with it and make a living with it, um, you know, technology ain't so bad. Technology allows us to do an awful lot that we couldn't do before, uh, and and so putting this sort of mantle on technology as evil, that's a part of this film that to me doesn't hold up as well. But the counter argument of um, you know, sort of be careful of, uh, you know, be careful the assumptions you ascribe to um, whether, uh, you know, technology versus, um, you know, let's just say blind faith mm-hmm. um, becomes a much more uh, interesting approach to the film. You mean you let all those people die just to test your creation? Yes. You really are a clever boy. Why did they have to die? You might as well say, why do we have to have evil? Oh, we wouldn't dream of asking a question like that, sir. Yes, why do we have to have evil? Ah. I think it's something to do with free will. Uh, you know, I think the cast is is pretty stellar. I mean, John Cleese, we've already talked about, Sean Connery... Ian Holm as Napoleon, who's fantastic. He's um, terrific. And then you've got the wonderful pairing of Shelley Duvall and Michael Palin um, in several different time periods, and they are just a hoot when they're together. It, every time it just cracks me up as as uh, Pansy and yeah. Vincent and uh, the, Michael Palin. Just This is just him at his finest. <laughs> you know, I hadn't made the connection uh, until this viewing that something that you said uh, about how, you know, Agamemnon comes back at the end. Um, I actually had never made the connection that it was these same people coming back in different timelines or in different periods of time. In those uh, two, right. Yeah, it, it really sets it up. Uh, it, it, it sets up the the mechanics, like the it, speaking of world building, the mechanics of uh, we'll call it reincarnation. Sure. Um, so that when we see Sean Connery at the end, it's not quite so jarring. 
Uh, yeah. And I'd never made that connection before. It always that that one at the end, the Agamemnon returns as a fireman at the end, always seemed kind of a discreet element because he's back in his original timeline. Right. Um, and and so I, it always sort of surprised me. But but watching it this time, that that finally made sense. Like I I get it. It, yeah, and actually, it's. Uh, I'm glad that you said that because I, I hadn't really kind of put the put reincarnation into the mix, but it does certainly feel that way because we see that whole Vincent and Pansy uh, love story going on across two different times. Right, they're so in the Middle it, Ages there, and uh, and then and they're, then in they're the on the Titanic. Titanic, yeah, yeah. and then uh, so it does. It does seem even more fitting that Agamemnon would come back for right. Kevin. Right. Yeah. All right, I interrupted you. So sorry, yeah, no, ahead. we have them, and then of course. Catherine Helmond and Peter Vaughn as uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ogre, and a fantastic pairing there. I, <laughs> what does she say to him? Hey, what shall I do to you? Terrify them. But what about me back? Well, you don't have to jump around. Just shout horribly and leer at them. You know, the way you used to. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy. Oh, she's so good. <laughs> she is just one of the great comedians. Oh my god. Just the way she delivers lines in things like this in Brazil. She was in what was it, soap? Yes. That she was in soap. for years. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So. This and that whole sequence at the end, it's just a it it's a not at the end. The the whole uh, giant, uh, the the ogre on a boat, mm-hmm. leading to the fact that the boat is actually a hat for a giant who lives underwater, just immediately under the surface of the water. I guess, right, uh, right. is brilliant. And this is another one of those bits in that fantastic interview that I watched. That the uh, that it turns out uh, Terry Gilliam actually was reading a book by Brian Frode, Frude, Brian Frode. Uh, I don't know how on, on pixies and mm-hmm. the, in there there's a picture with a guy in the water and a boat on his head and he just stole it it's very interesting because you look at other works that uh, brian froud whatever Froud's, you say yeah. has done um he was uh one of the artists i believe that jim henson hired in bringing to life the ideas for the characters in both labyrinth and the dark crystal yeah and so uh-huh. th- they do have that sort of feel. You know, he kind of creates these characters that have that kind of not quite right funkiness to them. And it fits in this world where, you know, a giant would wear a, a boat on his head and there's an ogre on the boat. And yeah, it just all kind of fits. Oh, it, it, it really, it's, it's, just, it's just perfect. And this was one of those sequences where the two of them, Palin and, and Gilliam, did not like the, I mean, they liked it, but they felt like it was too long. Uh, even though it was shorter than apparently what they had written, and and uh, and and so their their sort of recollection of it was that it was the weakest point of the film, um, it, that there wasn't enough action. Uh, I, I you know I just don't see it. I mean that's uh, to me that was one of the most unique uh, sequences of the film, and that it it ends with this wonderful giant standing up out of the water is uh is a beautiful climax to otherwise a really uh, kind of a funny sequence where they they're about to be eaten but they end up fixing this giant's back yeah. or this ogre's back which uh, you know he's been been aching because of all of his you know work and leering it, it's just a, a to me it's just a wonderful sequence yeah, it is. It really is fun, and it does set up the. It's it's just enough of that world of fantasy that they go into, um, to where we have ogres and giants. You know, we don't need much more. And then, yeah, you know, I don't know what it is that's living in the house, a little troll or something. But it's just enough. We don't need to see like dragons flying through the skies and just all this, you know, fantastical creatures running about. I he gives us enough to kind of show us this is that world, and so that we fully are invested in it. Yes. Sorry, I had a cough attack there. Oh, uh, that's okay. Mm-hmm. That's okay. You know, I, I think we absolutely have to mention our uh, six wonderful uh, dwarf actors who I think do such a great job in it. Uh, David Rappaport, Kenny Baker, Malcolm Dixon, Mike Edmonds, Jack Purvis, and Tiny Ross. You know, what's so great about this film is those actors were not, um, I, I think, not accustomed to being sort of central characters. Uh 
and the central characters or appearing or as themselves as appearing as yeah humans right uh, kenny baker i mean he he's appeared how many times now as r2d2 many <laughs> many times as r2d2 uh, I mean, he's currently filming as r2d2 I, I can't believe that i think that's so fantastic i know it really is yeah um, so yeah these guys uh you know this is a movie that really i mean highlighted them uh, it just allowed them to really shine and and to shine in a way that you know, I, I think they do. Uh, there is enough physical humor in this film, uh, but it it doesn't come at the you know physical humor around being short. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't come in a way. I think that that um, you know I I don't know, but it it doesn't feel to me like it's a way that is you know that is like clowning. Uh, that it's right. it, it suits the film and it suits the uh, suits the scene. Uh, I think the closest it comes probably is Napoleon when Napoleon has just a um, a fascination with watching little people hit each other, right? And these guys have such a natural affinity for getting in fights, uh, hitting one another that um, uh, that they you know they get off um, uh, fairly easily and end up having a lovely uh, uh, evening of drinking with Napoleon. <laughs> but but that's one of the things that I think is so special. It's not just about this guy who likes watching short people hit each other. It's about a guy who is genuinely fascinated with short tyrants as a short tyrant himself. So right. to me, that scene, that sort of making fun of size, uh, it, it really it, it fits making fun of Napoleon uh, yeah. in a way that's totally appropriate. Right. Um, I just love it. I couldn't. Yeah. I love it. It's it's brilliant. Just because you think I'm small. No, commander, you are not small. You are not small at all. You're not by any means. Five foot one is not small. <laughs> yeah, five foot one and conquer of Italy. Not bad, huh? <laughs> and you know, it, it is sad that uh, David Rappaport, who plays Randall, he, um, I guess, I, I don't know what, what happened in his life, but uh, he committed suicide in 1990 at the age of 38. <sighs> Which is sad because he's one of those guys that I uh, remember as a kid. I watched the, this TV series that he was in called The Wizard. Yeah. Do you remember that show? Yeah, I do. Where he was like a little inventor and he and uh, some some kids or something would, would battle evil around the world. And I had so much fun watching that show. I don't know how. Uh, I think it only had one season, but uh, I sure loved it. Wow. Yes. Uh, it's it's one of those things. It's like all coming back to me in a fog, <laughs> right? Uh, but yeah, that's that is one of those those. He's he also he's just one of those faces you you sort of can't can't miss. He was um, he's he's been in a lot of stuff. Yeah, he was in a lot of stuff. I, but it was it was this movie that just burned his face into my brain because he stands out as Randall. He does such a great job in that character that I, I think that I just essentially as a kid believed that, you know, he was that guy. And I, I really just grew up loving, loving him and just the outfit. I mean, he's in that like adventurer's outfit, you know, he's kind of got the little pilot's hat on and everything. He looks like he's going the, on an adventure. The red captain's jacket. Yeah. Did you read the, uh, do you read that? There's a, a quote from a book that I haven't read uh, by Robert Hewson. Uh, did you read that that clip? It just come, came up on Wikipedia that I find really funny. About mm -hmm. uh, the book is called Monty Python: The Case Against Irreverence, Scurrility, Profanity, Vilification, and Licentious Abuse. Uh, and he describes the dwarfs as a quote comment on the Monty Python troupe. The nice one, Fidget, is said to represent Palin. The self-appointed leader, Randall, is John Cleese. The acerbic one, Strutter, is Eric Idle. The quiet one, Og, is Graham Chapman. The noisy rebel, Wally, is Terry Jones. And the nasty, filth-loving one, Vermin, is Terry Gilliam himself. <laughs> I found that really funny. And apparently in the, in the uh, you know, there's another, uh, uh, there's another dwarf in, uh, on evil's side, Horseflesh. Mm. And uh, so the, the illusion there is that, in fact, these are seven dwarves. Mm. And they got Less split that. up. And that's, the, uh, that's what they were tossing in there. So. Uh, look at that. I know. That. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, well, Craig Warnock plays Kevin, 
uh, an actor who only ended up acting in this film because he went with his brother to the audition. His brother was doing the audition, and Terry Gilliam thought this kid had a, a much better presence. And so I don't know how that helped his relationship with his brother, but <laughs> but Craig is the one who got the part. And he acted in one more film after this uh, a few years later, and that was it. He, I don't think he's done anything else since. Yeah. I, w- what was the f- the other film? It was not a film we would have seen, right? Uh, it was a TV movie called To the Lighthouse that came out in uh, in 1983. Uh, Kenneth Branagh was in it. It was based on Virginia Woolf's uh, novel. Well, it's too bad he did a mighty good job in this movie. Yeah, I think he does a great job. Yeah. And then, of course, you've got, uh, in just very small parts, you got Jim Broadbent as the, uh, as the game show host, which is fantastic seeing young Jim Broadbent. And this I never knew until just uh, looking on IMDb now, but Tony J is the voice of the Supreme Being when, when he's flying around as just the floating head. And I had no idea that uh, I, I knew the voice, but I just it never put two and two together and realized it was Tony J, who I know best as the voice in, uh, uh, in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, in Disney's uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. He... Um, he Wait, is in that. Is he? Whoa, whoa! Wait a minute. Was he the the uh, um? Was he the bad guy? Yeah, Count he's, Frollo. Right. Yeah, right. He's Frollo in the Hunchback, and he's also he has a bit part in uh, in uh, Beauty and the Beast. Also, wow. so I'm yeah. telling you, when he sings that song in Beauty and er, in in uh, Hunchback, in yeah. front of the fireplace, Hellfire, right? Holy smokes! Oh yeah. Now that was a brave. That's a brave Disney tune right there. Yes, it is. Not often you see, you know, a, a salacious little uh, fire <laughs> demon yeah. dancing in the flames with yeah. a, a priest singing to her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not uh, not one I expected. Very brave there's, work. The, the, there's a reason that The Hunchback is one of my favorite Disney films. Yeah, yeah. There's also a reason they haven't made anything else quite like it. There is. Yes, there is. <laughs> Oh, goodness. All right. Yes. So uh, back to the Tony. J- That's great. I'm so glad you. F- I-, I never made that connection. I didn't even hear that voice. I actually thought it was uh, um, uh, Ralph, Richardson? Uh, Ralph Richardson doing something to his voice. Oh, it, well, that's that's what I think I always assumed. It was just until I, I looked right now and saw that. I was like, What's interesting oh. is Edwin Finn plays the Supreme Being's face. That's right. It's, I complete, it's just a Edwin mishmash of people. Right. Oh. That's pretty funny. Yep. All right. Who else? Well, I think it's very important to uh, at least discuss that this film is one of um, the handmade films, films that uh, George Harrison and Dennis O'Brien created this company, Handmade Films, in England that they were um, putting out there to basically try making some more independent British films. And I think they actually started with Life of Brian because uh, Monty Python, they had some financial backers, and those people backed out. And so these guys came on board to help finish uh, finish Life of Brian, thank the heavens. And uh, they went on to create a whole slew. I think they created, I, I don't know how many, I want to say 30-some films over the next, uh, all through the 80s. They were making a bunch of films with Nail and I, Mona Lisa. I mean, some some big films that they were making. And I think they always they, they did a bunch with the Monty Python boys. Eric Idle um, did a film or two with them. And um, they, they ended up kind of falling apart. But um, there's a book out there called The Amazing True Story of Handmade Films, A Fascinating Story Superbly Told. Uh, Very Naughty Boys, I guess, is the official title of the book. So we can put a link of that in the show notes. Um, but this film was one where Dennis O'Brien, I, I don't think George Harrison had a whole lot of direct connection to it other than, you know, some conversations with Terry Gilliam where he, I think he equated him to John Lennon because he was so headstrong and always wanted to win the fights and get things his way. And I think Terry Gilliam actually took that as a, quite the, uh, the feather of pride to wear in his cap, I guess being compared to John Lennon by one of the Beatles, you know, I wouldn't. I would probably be pretty proud proud of that myself. So, well, to be fair, George Harrison calls everybody John Lennon. <laughs> That's right. Oh, you're so John Lennon. <laughs> but Dennis O'Brien, the one of the other ones, he had uh, uh, a problem with the ending, I guess, and and really kind of fought Terry Gilliam on it because he felt the ending was too dark. 
the fact that they were going to blow up the parents and wanted to change the ending. And there was quite a fight. And this was one of those cases where they did a test screening and the test screening actually ended up working in, in Terry Gilliam's favor because as he relates the story, this is one of the test screenings where the film broke and they had to fix it and it, it was going on forever. And people were so frustrated with the screening that when they wrote their their results, everyone was putting like, what was your favorite part? And they would put the ending, meaning, thank God we finally get to leave. But <laughs> he oh. was able to use that as proof <laughs> to Dennis O'Brien that, ah, look, people love the ending. And so hence we get the ending that uh, we currently have. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, James Atchison did the costume design, and we don't usually talk about costume design in uh, on the show as much. Uh, the costumes are great in this movie. I think what's uh, interesting to me is that uh, Jim Atchison, this was his first feature film. He did a bunch of Doctor Who, uh, some other television shows. Uh, he did Full House, one episode of Full House as costume designer. Um, but and I bet it was the one where they looked the best. I'm sure it was. <laughs> Episode dated 17 March 1973. Um, and uh, then he went on and he did, you know, The Meaning of Life. He did Brazil. Uh, he did Highlander. Uh, and now, a- a- after a whole slew of movies, he is doing like the pinnacle uh, superhero films. He did uh, Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man 3, Daredevil, and Man of Steel. Um, So he was uh, responsible for the new Superman outfit. That's pretty fantastic. I know, for Zack Snyder. Yeah. You've come a long way, baby. He really has. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. Yeah, so that's that. Yeah. Well, it you know, and it does speak to this is a film that Terry Gilliam has created a very unique world, but he needs very, very competent people to help him create that world. And I think the costume design and the production design and art direction, Millie Burns and Norman Garwood, just uh, all of those people really help create this world that feels just wholly authentic. Yes. Yeah, it does. You know, there was so much of it that reminded me of, uh, who, did we talk about who did the... The production design for Harry Potter. I'm checking. That was Sorcerer's Stone was the first one, right? Who did the production design? Because so much of this, like particularly at the end, uh, reminded me of of Harry Potter and uh, production design by Stuart Craig. Oh, yeah. Right? And uh, Stuart Craig, responsible obviously for all the Harry Potters, but um, uh, also the Avengers, English Patient, like broad scope of production design from Stuart Craig. Um, but one of the things that I think is so fun about this is is uh, just seeing um, kind of the evolution of uh, production design in the 80s and, and just how good it can look, um, lest we talk about films that fail to meet that standard. Especially in the world of CG, here is a film that is using models and miniatures right. and uh, you know, just things, very visceral, physical things that are present. Absolutely. All right. Who else? What else you got? Uh, uh, I think that's it. Oh. All right. How'd it do? This film, uh, you know, this film really did pretty well for itself considering uh considering the time 1981 it's odd we, we've had talked about so many films from 1981 recently and it's funny that we start with a, a film from oh, 1981 that's in this series pretty funny actually uh but interestingly um looking at the films from 1981 i pulled up a, a chart of the 1981 domestic grosses um of the top 10 pete we just did a series on 1981 would you say that any of our films in the eight films we talked about in the 1981 series ended up in the top 10? Um, top 10 in domestic grosses. Right. Any of the films? No. No. I don't think that they, I don't think any of it. Well, besides Raiders. Well, that wasn't in our 1981 series. I know, but it was 1981. It was we, 1981. We did bring that up a number of times. We Except did, for, right. I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna go out on a limb. If there was a movie made in 1981, 
well, again, you're going to say it's not fair, but I would I would say maybe Time Bandits uh, would would do it. Sure, uh, but it doesn't. That's not fair because it doesn't. That's not, that's not in our series. Yeah, but but interestingly enough, of the top ten films that in, in the top domestic gross, only Raiders and Time Bandits of the ten eighty one uh, films from nineteen eighty one that we've talked about, those are the only two that ended up in the top ten. The next one is number 23, An American Werewolf in London. That's pretty funny. I, I think it's funny that of all the films we picked from 1981, none of them were in the top 10. And the two that we've discussed previously, or discussed outside of our 1981 series, are the ones that are in the top 10. Raiders of the Lost Ark, of course, number one. Uh, and yeah. then fleshing out the top 10, On Golden Pond, Superman 2, Arthur, Stripes, The Cannonball Run, Chariots of Fire, For Your Eyes Only, The Four Seasons, and number 10, Time Bandits. I'm just going to say, note to the producers of this show. (laughs) Maybe when starting a series on a year, you should just review the top 10 for that year (laughs) before you make your picks. It does sound like a fun group of films to watch. I'm not saying even (laughs) all of them. I'm just saying maybe you should review it. (laughs) I, I that actually took me by surprise when I saw this list. I'm like, how funny and maybe slightly embarrassing. Just a little bit. <laughs> but Jeez. hey, at least now we've talked about two of the top ten. Like I'm not I'm not gonna review the cannonball run. I'm not gonna do it, but I would do stripes. Just yeah. for grins. Yeah. Now I don't even think we'd have enough to talk about with stripes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right, so uh, we, we've made that show note. Yes. But this film did well enough to kind of get Terry Gilliam out of the world of, oh, he's just one of those Monty Python guys, he can't direct a film, to an actual filmmaker who could then go on and make other films and have a career of making films. He's now, uh, of his, I think, 12 films that he's done, that uh, Time Bandits, I think, comes in at number two as far as the uh, the gross, the uh, total gross that the film has made. Um, and I think if you adjust that for uh, where you put them all on the same scale, according to Terry Gilliam, Time Bandits is the still his highest grossing film when it's adjusted, which I think is pretty interesting. Oh, yeah. And it, I don't know what it says about the direction he's taken with many of his other films. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. But uh, yeah, it, it ended up costing, I found two numbers. Um, it looks like it cost $5 million, but then I saw another one that said $12 million, so I'm guessing that there was some uh, prints and advertising and other sort of stuff. So I'm going with the total number of $12 million for the budget. And then uh, domestic gross was $42.3 million. And uh, when you adjust that for... Uh, profit per finished minute it's coming in at about six hundred and seventy six thousand dollars per finished minute so it did pretty well for it itself did pretty well mm-hmm. i like it me too let's flick chart it let's do it head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel and you can see our stack ranking of all of our favorite films and we'll see we will just see if time bandits cracks the vaunted 100 Will it or I'm won't thinking, it? I'm thinking it looks. I'm, I'm thinking uh, it looks pretty good. I, I'm thinking so too. You'll love this first pairing: Time Bandits or Knowing, Pete's new favorite movie. Oh, for crying out loud! <laughs> uh, I'm going to say Time Bandits. I'm going to say Time Bandits too. Thank God. Don't you worry about that. Time Bandits or An American Werewolf in London. Time Bandits. Me too. Time Bandits or The Descent. Mm. I'm going to go Time Bandits on this one. It's got it's got the longevity factor. It's been around in my life a lot longer, and it holds a little closer to my heart. All right. Well, that makes it easier for me. All right. Time Bandits or Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Oh. I don't know. This might be something we'll get mail for. It might be, <laughs> because I'll be honest. Time Bandits go Time is the one Bandits. I would yeah. put on first. Yep. Even though I, I acknowledge Close Encounters is the better film, but man, I love me some Time Bandits. I agree. Mm, yeah, yeah, but here, Time Bandits or Inception? Oh, now it's I, now it's challenging. Now, yeah, it I'm is. Gonna a go, I'm going to go Inception on this one. Yeah, so am I. 
Time Bandits or Raiders of the Lost Ark? I've got Raiders to go of the Lost Ark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, we're not crazy. <laughs> Time Bandits or All the President's Men? All the President's Men. This is one where I would say I, I would go with All the President's Men, even though I would put on Time Bandits first. Yeah. All right, there you go. Look at that. Number nine. Number out of, nine. Out of 140. Cracked our top 10. Nice. Yeah. Well done, Terry. It, I know. It bumped up in the air out of the top 10. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with I that. I too. It feels good. Yeah. yeah. feels good. Wow. Hey, good talk. Where do we go from here? Well, we keep uh, talking about Terry, and we're going to talk about his next film, Brazil. You know, this holds a very done? special. It holds a very special place in my heart. That, why does it hold this? Did you, it's, was it like a first kiss movie, or it's, no? It's it's not like that sort of special place, but it's my favorite film. This is your very favorite film. It is my favorite film. We are talking about your favorite film next yes. week. It's going to be hard to figure out how to flick chart that one for me. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm going to have to let you lead the flick charting. Because otherwise, uh, you know, it'll end up number one. Well, here's the thing. Um, I It is also, well, I'm, we're going to talk about that next week. Yes. I'm excited to talk about this. We'll see. I am uh, too. Your favorite film. Wow. I know. Talk about an A-game show. I hope so. I hope I'm just not Jeez. too flustered about it and just clam up. I know. I know. Wow. All right. Well, I look forward to see what, what future Andy and future Pete have to talk about next week. I look forward to it as well. All right. I got to go to bed. I'm going to go first on Amazon. Okay. Because I, I think this <laughs> this level of exuberance is not something that I'm accustomed to finding on Amazon.com. This wow. is a five-star review. Uh, the title of the review is The Greatest Movie Ever Made. And he writes... A claim made by many about a select few, but in this case it is a fact. This is the greatest achievement in the history of human culture. Since childhood it was easy to believe, but watching it again recently has proven this truth with triumph. Thank you, Terry Gilliam, George Harrison, Michael Palin, and those who supported them in making the glory and the power that is Time Bandits. Wow. I right? felt like you needed an angelic choir. Right? You. <laughs> that was awesome. I know. That's how this our show should sound the every week. the greatest achievement <laughs> in the history of human culture. Oh, God. Oh, wow. Well, wait till you hear mine. Mine is a good... Bring uh, it. <laughs> for those who uh, felt that was a little strong, in one direction... This is by Leandert M. Craig, one star, title Waste of Time. Oh. All lowercase. And uh, this, is, this is basically how it goes. They wasted their money making this stupid movie. Yuck. Fooey. Don't bother. Terrible. Stupid. Not worth the time. Dumb. Horrible. Ew. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. You crushed it on the extremes <laughs> this week. Go Amazon! Andy, it is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. 
If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. I love The Next Reel Season 4. Do you know why? I don't. Why? Because we got to talk about my favorite movie, Terry Gilliam's Brazil. That's not even an adaptation. Uh, No, but it was such a great part of our our great Terry Gilliam series. And a few others in that series were adaptations, like The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, adapted from Raspi's stories, and La Jete, which inspired 12 Monkeys. Oh, right. And and for our Man With No Name trilogy, we saw how Sergio Leone's A Fistful of Dollars was basically stolen from Kurosawa's Yojimbo. We added Labor Day to our Jason Reitman series, adapted from Joyce Maynard's novel. Oof, there's one we'll always regret. Our big Stephen King series covered adaptations like The Shining, Cujo, Christine, and Stand By Me, great horror, and coming-of-age tales. Another Coen Brothers adaptation, too. We got to talk about how they turned Homer's The Odyssey into Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? For our holiday series, we did The Bishop's Wife and The Poseidon Adventure. And who could forget seeing Alec Guinness in the adaptation of Kind Hearts and Coronets during our series dedicated to him. We really need to do more of his films. Truly. We had our first film noir series with classics like Double Indemnity, Detour, and Out of the Past. And our black and white cinematography of James Wong Howe series with The Thin Man, Sweet Smell of Success, Seconds, and King's Row. So many adaptations. Oh, you're not kidding. Dive deeper into these originals and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support our show. Get the full list at thenextreel.com slash originals and start reading today.